All right, thanks for joining us here on this session. And the session track is again, why stay in New Hampshire for college? I'm uh, Chris Micus, your host today. Folks may see me um, being familiar from being the field supervisor at uh, a number of the events around New Hampshire. A uh, quick introduction, I myself have been uh, a first alum and uh, college level mentor for a while, and have also uh, started and mentored a couple teams across FRC and FLL and FTC in the last couple of years. So um, first has really helped me in my career, and uh, I've helped to spread the joys of first with a number of uh, teams and students over the years. Today, uh, we have a number of panelists here from across New Hampshire, and uh, we're going to begin by introducing them, and they're going to give a quick uh, five-minute introduction about themselves, uh, the position that they hold at their college, uh, the, any experiences they have with FIRST uh, related programs at the college, and then a little bit about um, you know why stay in New Hampshire for college from their perspective, and then we'll open it up for a little bit of panel discussion here at the end. All right, so first up is uh, uh, Larissa Bahi. Uh, go ahead, Larissa. Hi, good morning. My name is Larissa Bahia, and I'm the president of Lakes Region Community College. Um, we're located in Laconia, um, the north central, beautiful north central region of the state. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today um, and, and have a little bit of a conversation about why, um, why this is such a great location to, um, to continue your studies beyond high school, um, pursue them um, really as a lifelong passion. Um, in terms of my, um, uh, any kind of experience, direct experience that I've had with FIRST, I'll say I haven't been um, directly involved, but one of the things that has really intrigued me about um, this uh, particular type of activity is that it gives you problem solving skills. It gives you a challenge to look at creatively and think of how, um, what solutions might be out there to, to make something better. And if there's one thing that I think um, education, post-secondary education does for you is, is try to address problems that um, passions, concerns, challenges that are out there in life that and what role you have to play in that. And so I think um, FIRST does that very early on in a competitive environment, but it, it helps you think creatively. And that's one of the things that I, um, that I really think is really interesting about um, the activities that, um, that FIRST provides for our young people. Great, thank you, Larissa. We'll see you back in a couple of minutes when we get to a panelist Q&A session. Uh, next on the agenda, we have Jeff. Jeff, go ahead, tell us about yourself and your college. Yeah, uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, my name is Jeff Feltramo. Uh, I teach uh, mechanical engineering technology at uh, NHTI in uh, Concord, New Hampshire. Um, I have a, a long tenure with FIRST. Uh, back in 2006, co-founded uh, Team 1922 uh, with Hopkinton High School. And I know that uh, they're in attendance today, so go put a plug in for Go Ozram. Um, and then uh, since then, I, I've continued, I stayed involved with the team for a number of years, and then I've kind of transitioned my role uh, into mentoring. And then the um, last few years, I've been robot inspector, uh, judge. Uh, so I've kind of hit all levels other than a student. Um, so it's been a wonderful experience, and I'm well steeped in it and a firm believer in FIRST and everything. Uh, that it has to offer. So um, the fact that you're here and in this program is a great testament to, to what you're doing and I uh, fully believe in it. Um, I will give you a little bit of perspective what uh, our college can do at NHTI um, and with regards to FIRST and our why stay in New Hampshire. Um, we're located, centrally located right in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, if you haven't noticed it, uh, coming up Highway 93, look for the scaled model of the Saturn V rocket right along the highway, looks kind of neat. Um, we have, uh, you know, it's a community college, so the low cost is always very attractive and small class size. Uh, all of our instructors come with, I was thinking through our whole faculty and all our engineering technology programs, and every one of us come out of industry, uh, along with, uh, I'd say at least half of us have first experience. Um, so, uh, you'll, <laughs> we love to talk first with our students when they're in class. Um, the programs that we offer that might be of greatest interest to um, the FIRST community, obviously I'm mechanical engineering, but I also teach in manufacturing and our robotics and automation program. Uh, we have a computer engineering tech and electrical engineering program as well. 
Uh, and then the one that people don't think about is uh, we have a mathematics degree uh, in our program. Uh, and some of our students will use it as like a pre-engineering program to launch into a four-year university degree. Um, there are a lot of other programs at the other, we have seven community colleges and I'm not near as knowledgeable in the other ones, but there are other engineering programs uh, throughout all of them. And I would encourage you to look at those. Uh, some things that um, my students often take advantage of um, that may be of interest is once you get your two year associate's degree with us, uh, we have articulation agreements with other colleges in the state. Uh, our biggest one is to go to UNH Manchester uh, it's a, you're actually dual admitted. Once you are at NHTI, you're um, automatically accepted into the UNH Manchester uh, program. And you, um, electrical engineers go into their electrical engineering programs and my students go on to uh, the mechanical engineering program. Uh, Plymouth State, uh, it's a fairly new program, but they now have a, um, a robotics uh, program. Uh, Keene State, I'm sure Bert would love to tell us about that, uh, has their sustainable product design and we have sent some students that way. Uh, every year we get a few students that will go to UNH Durham and they have, Durham has the traditional suite of biochemical, civil, electrical and mechanical. And then there's an oddball one, I can't say I've placed a student, but if you're looking for an out of the box kind of an engineering experience, um, Dartmouth does it very differently. Uh, they offer up a, um, they call it a Bachelor of Arts uh, and then um, for four years, and you kind of, it's kind of a grow your own and you get to design it yourself. And then you can go on for a fifth year and get a bachelor's of engineering. Uh, for the females out there, uh, Dartmouth gets a lot of kudos in that they're, uh, they pass the 50% mark of their students are female uh, at the Dartmouth program. Uh, the last, um, last thing I do is um, the last couple of years I've gotten involved with the New Hampshire BioMade in the prior presentation with Army. Um, they are closely aligned with that. And from the community college standpoint, uh, it's provided our students some opportunities that haven't been in there in the past. Um, so as a community college student, in, uh, you apply to the BioMaid program, you are eligible to get into internships with bio-oriented companies in, only in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, there are transfers, there's a, what they call a transfer scholarship program at $5,000 per year that you can apply to. And then the really unique one is uh, you get access to undergraduate research uh, if you apply for it. A lot of times, you know, as an undergrad, people aren't thinking about research. Um, they don't think about it until grad school, but this is a unique opportunity um, to apply for and maybe get some really unique experience. For my students, they often shy away from it because they're mechanical engineers and like, I don't know bio, uh, but um, they're looking for any STEM-based major that is uh, related to it. So uh, it's a really unique opportunity only available to, um, there's many moving parts to that program, but these ones I just mentioned are available to, uh, uh, to community college system, New Hampshire uh, students. So um, I have some other things, but I want to make sure we get it all the time and then get to the other people. So we'll see if they come up. I'll pass it back to you, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. You, you touched on a, a couple of topics there that are sort of near and dear to my heart. You know, I myself came up through the community college uh, system and then went on to a four-year school, transferred in as a transfer student there. And then uh, I actually came out, you know, I had an interest in science and arts and things along those lines. You know, I didn't know if I wanted to continue on where I was in the restaurant industry at the time, you know, working my way through college, or if I wanted to get into something like graphic arts design or photography, but I went ahead and uh, I took data communications and came in through that route. And, uh, you know, it's funny that I'm here today in this room in Plymouth State University, and this happens to be the ceramics studio here in, in the center with the broadcastings being done down the hall. Uh, from the makerspace, but actually, uh, you know, I am working on a job uh, or a task at work that does involve ceramics. So it's interesting in my uh, 20 or 25 year history, you know, you don't know from where you're going to start, you know, where you're going to end up. And, um, I, you know, you're involved in the first and you kind of think, well, gee, I want to be a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer. And then you, uh, you know, hop into diff other things, you know, you do choose different paths, you know, throughout your career. So uh, I encourage everybody out there, you know, to, to look at the community colleges, look at the four year schools. And, uh, you know, even though you, you know, set your bar high and just have that different, you know, path and 
the different levels of the ladders to get there. You know, you don't have to achieve it all at once. Look for some help along the way. And uh, speaking of some additional help, we'll go out to uh, Bert. Bert, you're out there in uh, beautiful Keene, New Hampshire there. Uh, mm -hmm. Nice background that you have there. So tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the college out there at Keene and what you guys have to offer for students. Well, first off, I, I want to thank the organizers um, of the Governor's uh, Cup Robotics Competition for inviting us um, to present. And I, and I really want to wish good luck to all the participants. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, here I am in beautiful the Monadnock region, the southwestern corner of New Hampshire, and I'm happy to report that, uh, like many regions in the state of New Hampshire right now, we've, we've not been identified as a red zone for the spread of COVID-19. So um, could be one of the many reasons why a lot of people want to stay in the state of New Hampshire. Um, I don't have a direct um, experience with FIRST. Um, I'm an admissions officer, so um, I have more uh, broader knowledge. Um, I cover actually 42 different majors on campus, but I'm glad to give you an overview of the program that Jeff has mentioned, which is the Sustainable Product Design and Innovation Program here, um, otherwise known as SPEEDY on campus for short. Um, and really uh, the program approaches the artistic, scientific, technical aspects of designing consumer products from a viewpoint that values sustainability and sound business practices. So that is what kind of makes it a little bit unique. Um, Hands-on project-based learning gives students the tools and experience for jobs in, in this fast moving environment. So to move us toward a more sustainable future, um, our world needs to create change makers, confident and, and competent in, in their design thinking practices and grounded in a framework of sustainability principles uh, to guide their decisions. So the sustainable Product design uh, and innovation speedy program was designed uh, to integrate product design methodologies, cutting edge technologies, and also hands on model um, and prototype building within the context, um, as I mentioned, of the business enterprise and the liberal arts. So as a speedy major, um, you will navigate the design process relying on really the understanding of sustainability and your collaborations within interdisciplinary teams. Um, as you bring forth your unique solutions to improve our lives on the planet is really what it comes down to. So faculty members orient um, our students um, in a, a 53,000 square foot educational facility, which is relatively new. Um, it's called the Technology Design and Safety Center. And it, it, is, it is a net zero energy ready building eligible for LEED Platinum certification. So um, there, um, you will learn to propel your, initials con your initial concepts through a multitude of design iterations using state-of-the-art CAD CAM software, digital manufacturing technologies, 3D printing, and challenging model prototype construction. So you will experience and understand how things are made um, and the manufacturing process involved in the, pro in the producing um, them so that you can design durable products, minimize waste, um, consider the work experience of the makers and create economically viable products. So your cross-cultural dis, uh, disciplinary studies in, in management, marketing, operations management, and safety it, is all woven together in a capstone course um, in product design and manufacturing. So along the way, you know, you will test your, your tenacity and build your capacity to see a project through a successful solution, um, by the time you present your body of work at the Speedy Senior Portfolio Night, um, you will understand the big picture of manufacturing design's place in the world and how you will fit in and make your contributions to sustainable um, 21st century. So in addition to that, um, you know, many of our Speedy students attain national proficiency certification, uh, uh, providing clear evidence that they've, you know, they've, they've acquired much sought after skills using solid works. Um, our primary 3D CAD modeling and design tools, and others obtain mastery over um, uh, additive printing, C uh, CMM machines for quality control, and specific precision machining technologies. Um, so again, that's just a quick overview. Um, one of the things that you know we talked about was, um, or somebody had mentioned to me, if you could, if you could give us an example of a successful alum. And um, you know that's that's graduated in this program. 
and, and kids tend to relate to what you know, alumni are doing. Uh, we have a young man, Jaka, Jacob Levinston, uh, graduated in 2015, and um, he landed a job with, um, with um, Specialized, which is a, a, a bicycle maker. And, uh, and what he does now, and, and Jacob was an avid biker, I'm, I'm assuming still is, because he went out to California, an avid mountain biker. And what they do is they, he works on, on prototype components um, and he tests future bikes. And, uh, and right now with, um, you know, with uh, the, 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 the advent of e-bikes, um, I guess he's been, he's been assigned um, that as a, as a special project. So again, the countless career opportunities in this particular program, um, I am, I'm not a product of it, but again, I just wanted to give you an overview of, of what we provide here. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, we get students who come in through an articulation agreement as well. Great, thank you very much. You know, one thing that all you panelists have uh, talked a lot about is, uh, you know, the, the investment and the variety of programs you have, you know, on your campuses. And I've been really impressed with that as to some of the campuses, you know, I've been visiting at over the years and especially being here at Plymouth State, having the event here the past couple of years. You know, I've been up to uh, UNH and had a chance to walk through their buildings and see the investments and then just looking through the windows and, and seeing what they have in there. Um, you know, it, it's great to hear the different types of programs, Bert, that you're talking about out there at Keene. And Jeff, you're talking about all the variety of programs and the equipment and the tools and things that you have up there. Um, I have one last person here to introduce today, and that's uh, Simon. Uh, Simon, go ahead and tell us about, uh, you know, your connection here to FIRST and the college systems. Uh, thank you. So I actually, um, I have not yet worked with FIRST. This is my first first experience with FIRST. So I'm uh, pretty excited about this, but I work for Plymouth State University in the admission department. Um, I just came back to Plymouth, actually. I was a graduate from the class of 2018 um, from New Hampshire originally, went to high school in New Hampshire over near Burt and Keene, actually. I went to Fall Mountain Regional. Um, so I've you know been in New Hampshire a while, but came to Plymouth State for my undergrad, graduated in 2018, worked for St. Anselm College for the past two years. So another college here in New Hampshire um, in the admissions there, and then came back to Plymouth. And now I am here again, but uh, as you can tell, new, which is why I don't have a virtual background yet, but we'll get there. Um, but I just, I really, um, I really think that, you know, after listening to everybody present today and hearing what FIRST is all about, um, we really have a lot of great opportunities for students within the state of New Hampshire, whether you wanted to stick with going to a community college and then seeing where you're and what doors open for you after that, or you wanted to look at four-year schools right away. We have a lot of opportunities for students to get involved in things that, you know, you may not think New Hampshire has to offer, as you've heard today. Plymouth's new uh, program that we just introduced within the past couple of years is our electrical, electromechanical um, engineering and technology, I believe, electrical mechanical technology and robotics, I'm sorry. Um, so that's one of our really new programs that I think is a really special program to Plymouth. Um, it's alongside uh, our clusters initiative, which is a program that is essentially working to mimic the real world um, workforce that you'll get into post-graduation. So if you're part of this clusters initiative, you'll be working with students from all different majors, but you'll all have this topic at hand that will be, you'll be working towards solving a problem that um, will be benefiting the state of New Hampshire, which I think is a really cool thing. And um, it's just something that we all should be engaged with. Great, well, thank you, Simon. So, Really good variety of everybody here today, you know, from, from all across New Hampshire. Um, we had a couple of minutes to chat the other day, kind of as a dry run before this. And, uh, you know, one of the kind of talking points and trivia questions I asked the other day was, uh, you know, so how many opportunities are there here in, in New Hampshire, um, you know, for colleges and universities? Somebody out there in the panelists want to, you know, talk about the system that we have here in New Hampshire? I'll be happy to jump in, Chris. So sure, um, thanks. I think Jeff mentioned this earlier, but in terms of the public education system, so we have um, the university system of New Hampshire, and then certainly we represent the community college system of New Hampshire. There's seven community colleges across the state, um, and there are um, two additional academic centers um, attached with those community colleges. And so 
what that means in terms of um, availability of offering is that really anywhere you are in the state, um, there is a um, there is a two year institution that is available to you offering not just um, affordable post-secondary education, but with a breadth of programs as, um, as Jeff mentioned, so that um, that's a, certainly an option for all of the students that are across the state. And, and one thing that came up in our conversation, I don't know who it was that mentioned this, but another way to look at that is that even if you're in one end of the state and wanna move away from that end of the state to another end of the state, there's also um, an, institutional, uh, an institution available for you. Same thing with our four-year um, public partners. And then in addition to the four-year, there's a breadth of other institutions across the state too. So if you look at um, a, a small state, um, I think we're really blessed in New Hampshire to have a really diverse um, offerings of higher education, even, even with the small state that we are. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, often sometimes people overlook you know, universities in their home state, and, you know, and that's the topic here today is, you know, why stay in New Hampshire? Obviously, you know, implied in the topic there, people aren't staying in New Hampshire, you know, and are, and are going other places. Um, correct. You know, if you're on, on the seacoast and you live there all your life, you know, maybe consider to move further inland, you know, and an hour, hour and a half away, you know, go down to Keene or go up in the lakes region, you know, you're, you're still in New Hampshire, you're still close to a support network. And, um, you know, or come on out here to Plymouth State, you know, it's, it's much different here than it is kind of, you know, in Manchester. And, um, you know, you still still can't get a, a great education. Um, as I said, you know, myself, I'm an example of starting in the community, um, community college system. And then moving on to a university and transferring from there, it was always thought of that the best and brightest and the smartest, you know, didn't go to community college. But it was interesting that I was reading an article that maybe in this COVID situation um, that may be piquing, you know, folks interest. Have uh, you guys uh, been involved in topics along those lines? You know, people that maybe, you know, want to stay closer to home, want to spend, save some money. They're not quite sure as to what's going to happen you know, next year and, and want to mix in a dorm with, you know, other folks? Uh, I, I can't say that, you know, kind of the way it rolled around into this summer, we were all in question how this uh, fall startup would look. Um, but definitely um, we get feedback from students going forward. There's a lot of uncertainty. And I think uh, staying home can be, will be in a, um, a path for some people because of that uncertainty. Um, but like I said, it's hard to measure this this semester. Uh, <laughs> what happened? It's a pretty crazy start up here. Yeah, I think that there are absolutely families um, that are making different choices. Right? We um, the the traditional choice um, for some individuals was to always, you know, you want to get away from where you went to school. You want to see something different. You want to go. Um, you go have that experience somewhere away from where um, perhaps you're from or from family a little bit more of a distance. And I think families today are thinking of the affordability piece, but they're also thinking about the piece of, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and being far away from home, not knowing if classes will continue to be face-to-face, -face, if they're going to be remote. If, if classes are remote and you're paying $40,000 to take classes online, um, you might want to think about that. Um, and so I think there, there are families that are thinking about those choices. And one of the things that I'll say with regards to all of our institutions is that we really work on having relationships with our communities, um, particularly our em local employers. And so if you are thinking at all that you might want to um, live in New Hampshire at some point in your life, um, there is a value of, of building those relationships early on, um, whether it's an internship, whether it's a co-op, it's a job that you might have over the summer, um, all of those um, networks that you can build within your own community, I think it's very much, it's much easier to do that when you start early on in your professional career than when you start your senior year, right? Um, and, and being close to home um, gives you an opportunity to start building those networks um, because that's what we do. We're constantly working with our employers, with our um, local community partners um, so that we can place our students um, to, to be part of, you know, the prosperous communities we want to see. As yeah, great. The, um, the, um, the containment or our startup here at Keene State College, um, 
obviously it was, it was challenging like any place else. Um, we're leery, especially when the media came out with um, a lot of the horror stories across the nation about um, cases just jumping through the roof um, within a week to two weeks of the beginning of the school year. Um, I'm happy to report that we didn't really experience that. Our students have been pretty diligent. Um, we have a, a combination of different offerings. In other words, students can still take classes in person. Uh, we have hybrid courses. Um, we have blended courses and we have courses that are totally online. Uh, again, it's, it's course specific, um, but, um, but, and, but out of 3,400 um, total undergrads, we really only have 400 students who are totally online. So one thing we're, we found out was that our students still want that in-person um, you know, experience and they still wanna apply their learning um, in a practical way. So a lot of these programs that require labs um, have been sort of reconfigured um, to allow social distancing. Um, so we've made, we've made some arrangements. It has not been easy. We even um, we did our, our, our academic calendar. In other words, all of our students will be leaving um, at Thanksgiving um, for, the, for the rest of the semester. Um, and, uh, and so it's just really a matter of making it to that point. And luckily so far, our cases have been very few. The ones that have been, um, have been positive have been able to quarantine on campus. Um, so we've been able to contain the spread. So. Um, and, and to Larissa's point in terms of connections with the community and all that, I think that, I think we're blessed here in New Hampshire where um, the, you know, the, the whole state can, is, is a larger community. I mean, we have so many high tech jobs and companies in this state um, and, and it's, a, it's a growing area in New Hampshire. I mean, biofabrication, the growing industry, you know, that you see with, um, you know, with Army is another positive. So. I know locally we've been able to capitalize on the fact that Corning from upstate New York, Chris, <laughs> um, Corning has, um, has a, an optics uh, plan here and we have a, an optics uh, program on our campus. So um, again, we, we benefit in New Hampshire from, from, from the entire state as well as locally as, as Larissa has mentioned. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you touched on a little bit of a topic there. I was going to kind of ask next into is uh, you know, and when you're in high school, you typically think of, yeah, I'm going to pack up the car, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to move away. I'm going to be at this big, you know, university, with lots of new friends and new people. And um, then, you know, you think of being in the classroom, but you know, I think the high school students, you know, has sort of had a, a, a taste this year of, you know, a little bit of what the colleges have gone through in the, in the past couple of years. And that, uh, you know, they do have some classes that are, you know, online. Those are traditionally, you know, some of the ways that some of the colleges are going and Jeff, I'm sorry, uh, Bert, you had talked about, you know, rearranging the labs and things along those lines, you know, so I think the colleges are being probably just as, as flexible, you know, as the, the high schools are in terms of, you know, online learning or hybrid learning, but, you know, everybody likes to be in the classroom. You, you know, you get the social interaction, you get faster feedback, you know, you get a teacher to be over your shoulder. Um, are there any other things, you know, going on out there, um, you know, that are unique to kind of, you know, counter the COVID and, uh, you know, keep people learning at the same pace that they would? I, I would chime in as a, we're an engineering technology program. Uh, it's a whole other discussion if you want to talk about engineering versus engineering technology, but the hallmark is hands-on. And, uh, you know, social distancing was a challenge in that regard. And yeah, um, any lecture kind of stuff has moved online, but we have held fast on any lab oriented class. Uh, I myself, uh, I have, um, five labs a week uh, when I'm still meeting with my students. We reduced our sizes, you know, so at lab I normally have 10 to 12 students. I now have five in, so I get to do it more times, but uh, we have stayed true to our uh, mission as hands-on engineering technology program. I would agree with Jeff. Um, you know, we certainly, the, the programming that we were able to put in a remote format, we want to be able to do that, um, not just to limit the number of students that come to campus, but also to open up space for those programs that perhaps can't 
have that luxury. So at Lakes Region Community College, we have automotive programs and electrical technology program and advanced manufacturing programs, nursing programs. Those, those programs have to do labs um, that are hands-on. And because of that, it means that we really had to rethink how we utilized our space. We had to rethink our schedules um, so that we could utilize not just different spaces for those laboratories, but bring in um, ventilation systems that were able to recycle the air, um, make sure that everybody had appropriate PPE, both our students and our faculty. Um, the schedules allow for students, um, for the classroom to have um, a time when it is, um, when, it, when, it, when there's no one in there so that the air can be recycled before bringing students back um, into the space. So all of those things were, um, strategies that we put together beginning really in April um, as we were thinking about our reopening plans um, for the summer and the fall, but with the intent that we knew our students needed to be in the classroom um, and, and they needed to have that hands-on instruction. So it's about how do you do that in a safe as, as environment as possible. Um, and and it, it really has paid off. I think all of us um, have really, if we've seen cases, they have been um, relatively small numbers of cases, um, but but still being able to say, okay, our students are are getting the education that they need, um, and and getting the the particular the hands on practical pieces of that education that can't be easily de uh, delivered through a remote or online environment. Yeah, I don't know how I would have made it through some of my electrical engineering courses, you know, without being hands on there in the lab, and it sounds. Like you guys are continuing that, you know, Jeff going in, you know, maybe two or three times a week instead of just that one lab, you know, that you have to, to monitor, you know, reducing the number of students in the class, but still getting hands on with things like the oscilloscopes, hands on the tools. If you're rebuilding a, a, a car or, you know, mechanical labs and shops and things like that that's good that the schools are being flexible like that to make sure that the, the quality of the, the education is there you know and making sure that at the end of the four two or the four-year program that somebody is really able to go into the workforce and um you know pr participate in everything and be able to you know take advantage of what they have that's great there's another um, aspect i'd like to bring up um, as a highly residential campus one of the challenges has been student life um, you know, res halls and all that and student activities, student involvement. Um, I happen to coach a men's ice hockey team, which is a, another duty that I have on, on this particular campus. But uh, um, that in itself has been a challenge, but we've been able to um, get the guys on the ice, um, albeit, you know, smaller groups. Um, so we divide up, the, you know, the defensemen versus the forwards. We have goalie sessions. Um, so far, so good. I mean, we're trying to keep the interest level up as much as possible, but our students def definitely need that, um, that outlet. And luckily, we've been able to, to somewhat, you know, satisfy that outlet to a certain extent, although it's never, it's not going to be the way it used to be. Um, you know, there's no, there's no actual competition amongst colleges right now and universities in our area. But we're doing the best we can so that if a student has a special interest that they want to pursue, you know, in college, um, our radio station is active. A lot of our clubs and organizations are still active. So, um, so there's life even beyond just the confines of a classroom or a lab. Yeah, that's good to hear. I think, I think like for, you know, all of us, especially the community that our schools build and the community that our schools have really is what's making these students be successful throughout COVID. And the fact that, you know, they want to be here, they want to be back at the school, they want to be in the classroom. So they're willing to make sacrifices alongside the faculty and staff making sacrifices. And it's all really just a, a collaborative effort to make sure that we're able to give our students the best education that we can, all while they're still able to have the college experience that they signed up for and that they really wanted. That's good to hear. You know, we've talked about the numbers in New Hampshire and they are pretty low, although this this week, you know, things are a little bit changed and different. But, uh, you know, we haven't had some of the outbreaks that some of the other college campuses have. And it sounds like, you know, students in New Hampshire, you know, really want to learn. They're focused on their education and, um, you know, we'll, we'll get through this and hopefully you'll be in a part by the, you know, the college is not being able to have any cases and spreading that out. Um, 
talk about things, you know, kind of out of state, I guess, tongue in cheek. I, I mentioned this the other day. I, I forget who answered it, but, you know, hey, let, let's run off to Florida, you know, where it's nice and sunny and there's beaches or run off to California where there's waves for colleges. And, uh, you know, we can we can hit the beach. You know, why wouldn't you guys recommend something like that? I mean, personally, for me, I wouldn't I when I was a high school senior, which was, you know, seven, eight years ago, I was thinking I'm going to go to school in California. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to be in San Diego. It's going to be the coolest thing ever. And then I went online and I looked up the price of that school. When I looked at the price of that school, it was double the cost of what Plymouth State and what Keene State were. And you know, when I looked at finances and I was like, well, that's, you know, I'd either, I'm either going to be able to graduate with a little bit of debt or I'm going to graduate in a whole lot of debt. And I'm going to have to move my whole life across the country for that debt. So for me, the affordability of going to an in-state school really was what kept me in New Hampshire. But then also once I got to Plymouth and I realized, wow, I can access everything I've ever wanted from this school. So whether I wanted to ski, hike, go down to the ocean. Sure, our waves aren't as big and the water's not as warm, but we still have an ocean and it's still a beautiful ocean to go visit, you know? So that's New Hampshire really is a spot that you can do anything you want to do. You just have to realize that it's there for you, I guess. Yeah, that's great. I think Simon, um, you know, articulated it very well. Thank you, Simon. I think certainly a lot of our students aren't necessarily thinking about, you know, kind of the affordability piece and what, you know, what, you know, what this means later on. Um, but a year, a semester into those decisions, all of a sudden you realize kind of the consequences of those things. And there is something to be said for being closer to home in a place where you, you know, there's some level of familiarity for you, where you are not just a number, you know, all of our institutions, no matter whether they're large or small, and certainly, I, you know, Lakes Region is a very small institution, but all of us really think about what that personal education means. Um, and especially in the programs we're talking about, um, programs that are you know, technology focused, you, you really do see that all of that work, there's a lot of interaction between faculty and student. It is based on that, on that kind of one-on-one -on -one attention um, and, and the creativity that comes from that, from problem solving and, and really thinking a, an issue through. And so it's really hard to get that. At a, at a very yeah. large institution, and it's hard to get it when you don't, when you can't make those connections because it's it's more it's difficult to engage in those connections in a very large setting. And so I think that's one of the things that New Hampshire has to um, to really uh, say for itself is that all of our institutions are relatively are small enough mm -hmm. that you can have those types of interactions with your faculty members, with your colleagues, and with the, the companies that you're gonna be working for, you're gonna have access to those companies while you're in college. If you want to, you can certainly do that. And, and that type of networking um, is huge once you, you know, once you finish your education in terms of finding the, the career that you really want. Yeah. I, it, sorry, Chris, if I could just say real quick, okay. I, think that, I think if we talk about like the transition period too for New Hampshire students going from high school to college, when we talk about class sizes, the class size you have in high school is going to be very similar to the class size that all of our institutions are offering. So you, you know, you might have some lecture halls, but none of our institutions are strictly lecture based or anything like that. So you're going to get that hands on learning that you've always had throughout your education in the state of New Hampshire, always or at college as well, which I think is really nice about our institutions. Yeah, those are all good points. And um, w one thing that happened to me personally is that I was, uh, you know, a mentor on a team in college and I ended up getting an internship at the uh, main sponsor. And while I went back to college um, full time, um, you know, I had worked there part time and then I had my summer internships back with them full time and you know, it, it was great. And I did live near home as well. I, as you called me out earlier, you know, I am from upstate New York and a transplant to New Hampshire, but it was good to be only a few hours from home. I was on a different campus and I did go to community college for a while and save some money that way. But then I had that great relationship where the, the internship and was a good thing for me because all the people that I saw around the building 
were also on the first team with me. And we had that um, cooperation and we knew how to work with each other because we had practiced that in front of the high school students, you know, over building, building the robot. And we had, you know, higher different challenges back at, at work. And I was able to save up and, uh, you know, save some money that way. I think I made a, uh, a comment, the, you know, the other day about, uh, you know, going out of state to Florida. And I think maybe it was Bert, you had said that, you know, what happens there, you know, to the, to the folks that see North Carolina or the South are mm. a nice place to go. Yeah, I'm, I'm the, uh, I happen to be also the transfer advisor. And uh, it's not uncommon to see students from New Hampshire who went out of state, particularly as far down as uh, Florida and the Carolinas. And, uh, and after, after a semester or two, they realized that, well, not only is it becoming cost prohibitive, but, but the weather doesn't change a whole lot. It's hot all the time. Uh, so the grass isn't that much greener. And, uh, and they come back to the state of New Hampshire. And this is the first thing they say is like, oh, my God, did I miss the four seasons? I missed the opportunities. And aside from the fact that Simon mentioned, um, I don't want to be indebted, um, you know, with, um, with, with, with student loans for the rest of my life. So, right. um, so yeah, yeah, there, I mean, there is a lure, don't get me wrong. Tampa is a beautiful place. I've been there a number of times, but, uh, but, it, but it, it, it gets old pretty fast. Yeah. What I say to those folks is to, you know, stay in New Hampshire, keep it local, keep the, keep your costs down, um, you know, get a good internship, you know, folks like, uh, you know, BA systems, we've got great, uh, internships for folks that have first experiences, you know, build up your skills and your tools and, uh, get yourself in a nice, well-paying career and, um, then go to those nice places for vacation. And then you can go to the outer banks and you can get a nice house for a week, or you can go to Florida and get a nice house for a week, or you can afford to go to Disney world, you know, for a week. So that's you know, my Chris, personal perspective on it. Um, one of the things that um, that I think is important to think about here is that, and I think you mentioned it when you mentioned um, BAE and your, and um, and internships. You know, our our employers are are dying to have more and more qualified workers here in our state. We, you know, our our communities want you and want our students to stay here. We need to have those skilled employees um, to make sure that all of our communities continue to prosper. So there's opportunity in New Hampshire, um, and and the more people leave our state, obviously opportunity is they're taking those skills with them. So there are jobs here. There are you know wonderful opportunities for careers, and we have a you know a, a, a one of those quality of life. Um, it, you know, it, characteristics that that really is not replicable in all other places, right? And so, yeah. if we think about what we have to offer, um, there are certainly career opportunities, but there's also the type of um, quality of life that you know that is enviable. Um, and so, we just want our, our students to think about that, um, right. and that we want them to stay. Well, this has been some great conversation here and uh, we'll probably try to wrap it up here because we've got some folks who use this channel again. But I want to kind of conclude with two points. Um, one of them is that I kind of sort of scratched out here on paper here. You know, we don't quite have home economics like we used to, you know, in, in high school. And, uh, in, you know, one of the courses that I took in college was engineering economics. And I was like, what do I need this course for? You know, give, give me another technical course, you know, but it really helped me in, in project management and being able to budget things. So kind of scratched out here, I have 52 weeks times 16 hours a week times $8 an hour. That comes up to $6,600. And uh, that's pretty interesting because, you know, if for a year you put in, you know, two days a week at the job for $8 an hour, you know, a little bit more than minimum wage, you know, you get about $6,000 and if you save that up for college. Well, that's about what we're giving away today in some of these scholarships for these high school seniors, $5,000 and $5,000, not just for one year, but for some of the other, you know, follow on years. So, you know, what I'm trying to say there is, you know, take your time and invest it in the first and win a scholarship, maybe instead of, you know, just a, a job at $8 an hour, you know, you get, you got those two sides to weigh is, you know, these internships and the experience that you're going to get that way. Uh, last thing I want to do is kind of throw it back to you, Jeff, uh, maybe in just a minute or two, you know, I know we can talk about this for hours and I happen to do this, you know, myself as I was a high school senior. And I think it's important to touch on this. Uh, you know, Larissa had 
you know, talked a little bit about the, the jobs that we have here. And we know that the trades market, you know, is really a field to get into as well. Um, anybody that owns a house trying to get, you know, a plumber or an electrician or somebody in there, you know, it's really hard to find people. You now I've read articles like, you know, Bill Tromley, you know, they're, they're looking for, you know, a, a lot of people and they can't find people to come, you know, and, and fix hot water tanks and heating systems and such. But Jeff, you had talked about, can you tell us just maybe just another minute or two about the difference between, you know, an engineering course and then say a bachelor of science or those, those type of courses? Yeah, real quick. Um, so you, I mentioned we are an engineering technology program um, and then there's engineering programs. Uh, short answer is engineering technologies tend to be less math, more hands-on. Um, and whereas the engineer is a little bit more abstract, higher level math, less hands-on. And so it's just something when uh, you guys are shopping for engineering programs, if they hang technology on the end of their program, um, you know, something to be aware of. Uh, we have both transfer options available. They can transfer into an engineering technology or an engineering program um, with Manchester and Durham. All right, we're uh, going to go back to Dave now. We appreciate everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. It'd be great to Take talk care. about this for another you. couple hours, but uh, <laughs> we got more content to go. Thank All you. All right, thanks everybody for joining us here at the Governor's Cup. Take care. Bye bye. Come visit the schools. Come visit the schools.